Hey guys, Kate here, host of the Primitive Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. On today's episode, we have Michelle McCord. She's the superintendent at Friendship ISD. It's really glad to have her on the podcast. As you know, with the, the pandemic going on and all the things associated, it's a really challenging time for public schools. And so I'm certain you'll appreciate and enjoy my conversation with Michelle as she talks about leadership and the things that she's learned along the way. Michelle, thank you for joining our podcast today. For those who don't know who you are, like where, where are you from and how long have you been at Friendship? And you know, tell us about your background. Yes. Well, first, thank you for having me. Sure. Um, so Michelle McCord is from a small town outside of Wichita Falls, Texas. Okay. Iowa Park. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So if you say that... Um, kind of under your breath. People think you're saying Highland Park. Okay, in Dallas. In Dallas. And then when you say, no, Iowa Park, they say, oh. And so <laughs> not the same, not the same, but a great place. Sure. Um, and so I've been in Lubbock for uh, 10 years. Okay. Yes, uh, came here uh, by way of Allen, Texas. Okay. And my husband and I moved out here. Uh, his job Pretty much if we were near a gas station or an airport, we, okay. were, we were good. <laughs> so it gave me the flexibility um, to uh, come out, work for Friendship. Spent the first five years as an assistant superintendent okay. over administrative services, which is a code for all bad things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all complaints all the time. All right. And uh, then after five years, uh, my my friend, mentor, the former superintendent, Dr. David Vrunland, left uh, to become the superintendent at Mesquite ISD. Okay. And um, the board of trustees at Friendship took a chance on this yeah. girl from Iowa Park who had never been a superintendent before. And um, so I've been in the role since, uh, officially since November of 2015. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, so ha had you always dreamed about being a superintendent? Like when you thought of your, your vocation and your career, like was that always what you're aiming for? Is it wrong to say never? No. <laughs> I never thought about being a yeah. superintendent. Yeah. Um, I did not aspire to the superintendency. Um, in fact, education is a second career for me. Okay. Um, I am a, a licensed professional counselor. Okay. And uh, my license is inactive right now because I kind of have a full-time yeah, job yeah. A gig going on right now. And the continuing education hours are totally different. Yeah. But um, uh, in my role as a counselor in private practice, um, because I was new to the, the, um, the place where I was working, uh, and I didn't wasn't the part of very many of the um, insurance panels, which were hard to become providers on. So I most of my clients were uh, women living living in poverty. Okay. Um, or uh, child protective services, okay. children who had been removed from the home. I was the counselor of the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and what I discovered is that um, many of these women were repeating the cycle of poverty mm -hmm. and abuse um, to their children. Now, maybe the abuse didn't happen at their own hand, but they were involving themselves in unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, a family member or a boyfriend was abusing the children. And I don't know how I got to be you know, early 30s and not realize that my upbringing was not the norm. Mm. So my parents, I was raised by godly parents and uh, two older sisters, had to throw in older, um, <laughs> two older sisters. Um, and, um, you know, all of my life, all they ever did is support and encourage me and tell me with hard work, you can become whatever you want to be. And I don't know how I got to, all through a master's degree and all of that in counseling and not realize that that was the exception, not the norm. Mm -hmm. And I saw that these women um, were just, I might as well have said, you know, uh, 
equate getting a degree or some kind of job skill. Um, might as well have said, you know, hey, let's go to Mars and um, let's hang out there and you can do it. Mm. Um, it was so foreign to them and they just didn't think they could. And so uh, I wouldn't say that I think God called me into, or I know he did, into public education. I just felt like I wanted to intervene um, with young boys and girls uh, before they got to the stage where they were already repeating this cycle yeah. of poverty and abuse. It's really good. So can you do that? Like, can, are you able to do, you made that transition because you wanted to intervene. That's a really powerful statement. And you're the superintendent of a very large school. Um, and I don't know anything about public education, so this could just be total perception, you know, but you, you're dealing with bureaucracy, you're dealing with state stuff, you're dealing with, I mean, there's just got to be multiple levels to that onion. So five years into being superintendent, certainly longer within the school system itself, have you found yourself able to intervene? And, you know, what kind of challenges have you kind of come across that you're willing and capable of sharing that have impacted your ability to intervene? Like, what does that look like now, kind of boots on the ground, so to speak? Well, you know, I've been in public education for 20 plus years now, so don't be trying to do the math on that. <laughs> okay. This is my second career, and I've been doing it for over 20 years. But, um, so certainly as a, as a school counselor, yes, you can intervene. And uh, so firsthand proof of that is as a high school counselor, uh, that first-generation college students, I don't know if you've ever filled out a FAFSA. It's been a long time. Oh, my word. If I ever well, did. you need a PhD <laughs> yeah. in something that I don't have to hmm. know how to do that, even really to, a, um, to register for the ACT or SAT. Hmm. You don't just, you know, hit the button, I want to take this test. And then it's, you're there. it's involved. Yeah. So I was able to um, remove some obstacles. Um, but now in my role as a superintendent, it looks different. Um, obviously, I'm more indirectly impacting lives, but despite the bureaucracy and um, just all the madness of this thing we call planet Earth mm -hmm. and public education, is that the most salient or significant predictor of the educational outcomes of a student is the effectiveness of the teacher. Mm -hmm. And outside the, you know, of course, the influence of the parent. Right. But if you have an effective teacher, if you can get an effective teacher uh, instructing children, then those kids are going to have great outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when I say great outcomes, I'm not talking necessarily about maybe you don't want to have a four-year degree, but some sort of post-secondary training so that you can be a welder or you can contribute be, to society. Yeah. Contribute to society, mm. be a responsible citizen. Mm. And so in my role, it's more indirect. So uh, there's not a direct correlation between the effectiveness of the superintendent and the educational outcomes of kids. But I have tremendous influence over hiring of teachers, mm -hmm. who we hire. Another thing is too that I, I think that teaching is a calling. Why else would you do it? Yes. Because you don't get paid very well. Um, um, kind of like a pastor doesn't get paid very well. Yeah. Sometimes your own children sacrifice, right. <laughs> your own family sacrifices right. because of your calling. But it's important the people that we hire. And then teaching is a calling. And I, I haven't met a teacher who wouldn't do anything if she knew how to do it. So equipping, right. the equipping of people, the onboarding of teachers. And that's changed a lot over the years. Used to, you shut the door, you kind of did your uh, teaching in the classroom in a silo. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't work. Yeah. So, so partly that, with, my first question is like what you see, how do you see your role as a leader? Like in your, in your, in your role, in your school, you, and you kind of started touching on it a little bit in terms of influencing teachers. And, and so tell us like when you think of your role as a leader and your responsibility in your organization, what, what kinds of things do you think of in terms of, of those things? So despite, you know, the endless tasks of the major operating systems of this organization right. that has 1,250 employees, my primary responsibility is to ensure that every single one of those souls 
that walks through the door of friendship schools, those children, that we create an environment where they feel safe, where they feel valued, and where we push them to, um, to beyond, uh, achieve beyond what their wildest dreams are, to equip them for the endless opportunities that no doubt the future holds for them. That's the primary role. And then I would say the secondary role right behind that is the only way that the, the kids are gonna be successful is if the adults around them are equipped to, to do the job. And so my job is to um, work alongside our board of trustees, of course, to make sure we're allocating time and resources so that we're investing in the people so that the children can, um, can be who they aspire to be. I mean, the future's at stake. Uh, really, eternities yeah. at stake. Right, right. It's really good. Um, you know, just just like parlay, like just thinking of this in the context of an organization, and you're, what you're really talking about is culture. You know, like creating a culture and an environment where your children, you know, you thrive. They, the students thrive. You're you're setting them up for success. Then I love how you answer. You know, the second thing you said was really equipping the adults. You know, equipping the teachers and the. The, all the staff and the coaches and things like that with the necessary skills and tools to allow the students to, to, to succeed. And in that way, it's, it's, it's very much like a regular organization, you know, where you have healthy cultures and you have healthy leaders and where you have healthy leaders, you usually have healthy cultures and, you know, it all starts to kind of work together. Um, it's really good. How do you approach failure? Like when you think about your own leadership journey and like, is there, is there a way that you, you know, even pragmatically approach failure or what, what, what comes to your mind when you think of failure? Well, what comes to mind is um, failure is a great teacher. Mm -hmm. Failure is a great teacher. Um, you know, it's painful. Failure is painful. I think that probably most of us, as we look back on our lives, is that I know particularly in mine, it has been my greatest failures in which I was able to um, find purpose in mm -hmm. that pain. Um, but failure is, is important to the success of an organization because if you're not failing, that means that you're probably stagnant, that you're not trying new things. Um, you have to create an environment where it's okay to fail. Um, as an organization, the bigger we get and as important as the stakes are, fail fast, mm -hmm. you know, fail forward. All those things, kind of cliches that you hear, but they're true. Yeah, for they're sure. They're true. None of us like to fail, but really that you have to fail if you're going to um, progress. Right. I've never thought of a school your size having so many employees. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's a lot of employees um, and a lot of layers of leadership. Like, you know, clearly you're, you're, you're distant from some of those levels just because of the necessity and size, just like in any organization. Is there a way that you, um, like, thinking about communication, like, how do you approach communication within your, your organization, your school, to ensure that everyone's on the same page to the greatest degree possible? Like, what does that even practically look like? Yes, well, it's complicated. Really hard. For sure, it's complicated, <laughs> yeah. for sure, because I would say any large organization, that's one of their biggest challenges, is, um, is the communication across all the levels. And so for us, what that looks like is, you know, the different traditional mediums of mm -hmm. trying to communicate people, keeping people informed. But I think how you accomplish that is, first of all, we need to make sure that for our organization, you know, we're a taxing entity. Uh, we're using other people's money and we have other people's children. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we need to make sure that, first of all, that we're clear on our beliefs. That's the foundation. And they're not our beliefs. These are our stakeholders' right. beliefs. And so that we have can coalesce around uh, shared beliefs that these are what the people whom we serve. Mm -hmm. And then once you know what your beliefs are, that's the foundation upon which we build everything that we do. And then how do we communicate that? Well, people have to know what the beliefs are. So it's very important, the onboarding mm -hmm. of new employees. Uh, reminding um, existing employees that, you know, we may get bigger 
and the faces may change and there may be four, more faces to look at, but our beliefs don't change. And uh, the other thing about that is for me to ensure that we're pushing the organization forward and that we're kind of on the same page, if you will, is that I am spending my time uh, ensuring that uh, my closest advisors, our cabinet, mm -hmm. that I'm pushing, that I'm making sure that, that um, our beliefs are the basis of what we talk about. Right. And uh, I even have them on my wall, um, every principal meeting that we have. So I brought up the importance of a teacher. Um, behind the teacher, the most significant predictor of educational outcomes of kiddos is the effectiveness of the campus principal. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you hire the right person. Also, we use those beliefs as a foundation to build what we call a learner profile. So. For our learners, these are the attributes that we want to see in our learners. Same thing as a leader, this leader profile that we created uh, based on the, the foundation of our beliefs. And it helps me when we're hiring people um, to ask questions around, um, you know, these leadership qualities. You know, there are tons of uh, frameworks through which to view leadership right. and making sure that what does excellence in leadership look like in friendship? Hmm, it's really good. Um, you you know, co coming with all, with all that responsibility of leading 1,200 people in the communication and in the belief systems and the principles and understanding stakeholders and like you, th that's a lot of moving parts. Not not to mention the, the the government and state and policies and and tests and all this stuff. How do you pursue your own personal growth? How do you kind of like work your way through all the, the, that stuff, which is important, and focus on your own, your own growth, your own soul? You know, how do you do that? Well, one of the ways I do that is um, just through my faith. That is very important to me. Um, and what does that look like for me? Well, that for me, it's different for every person, but for me, that is setting aside some time of quiet. And so I have to um, set aside each morning some time of quietness um, to silence the voices so that I can hear the, the still small voice. Mm -hmm. And then also um, for me, it's uh, listening to leadership podcasts, reading books, um, looking back at history, at what great leaders did. Um, great book that I recently read um, I think it's called Leading in Tumultuous Times Okay. Uh, by uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Okay. I think, yes. Uh, I'm not sure I got her, the author's name right. But anyway, it's a great book. I think it's a Pulitzer Prize winning book. And looking back at um, how did Abraham Lincoln... Okay, yes. Phenomenal book. Yes. And, and Linda Mee Johnson. Was it Lincoln, Johnson? Um, FDR. That's a FDR, that's right. It was, it's a really good book. Yes, yes. So, you know, sometimes we think that this crazy 21st century world we live in, that crazy is new. Um, you know, crazy and crises and all of those things aren't new. Right. Um, I guess there's really nothing new under the sun, but learning from the past, mm. um, you know, helps um, me try to keep that in perspective and not make those mistakes mm -hmm. and just learn from right. the ups and the downs that other leaders had. Yeah, you find it encouraging when you read through some of those challenges, like I think of Lincoln particularly, you know, because we all think now is the most divisive and, you know, angered we've ever been, but really it doesn't scratch the surface in terms of a real civil war. Right. So like what, what, like, do you find comfort in that? Like, is it the perspective it offers you that's the most encouraging? Like what about learning from history particularly kind of helps you in terms of your, 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 your frame of mind. So I'm just curious. I think it does provide, um, maybe ironically some comfort yeah. to know that, uh, you know, these, these divisive times that, um, people, uh, having very different opinions about things, different beliefs that, um, you can still, uh, have a common purpose. And uh, I don't know what it's like for other people, but for me, it's just really clear that we're dealing with children. 
And, you know, clearly the future is at stake. And though while the parents have different ideas and we may have different ideas and the government, they have different ideas, but we can come together or coalesce around that purpose and to see how someone else did it. Now, of course, Lincoln wasn't perfect, but certainly, you know, those were dark. Those were dark days. And um, he had a great team around him. Um, I have a great team around me, uh, you know, and I, I know that I can't do it by myself. It, yeah. it also, one of the things that Lincoln did that I think set him apart is that he, he went to the front lines. He was, he was in the trenches. He was with the foot soldiers, if you will. And where I find meaning when it's, you know, I'm just dealing with things as a superintendent that really have very little to do (laughs) with educating children, whether it's, um, you know, tax laws or, um, you know, looking at land purchases, all these things are important, Sure, but it's not really what lights my fire is I go to a campus Mm. and I will, um, love to do like what is called a listening tour. Mm. A listening tour is just going to the teacher's lounge, listening to teachers. When I first did that, they were like, oh, what's happening here? Right. What, what, what is her agenda? Suddenly the topics changed. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think that over time they get that, you know, it's not that I'm listening in to see, are you talking about instruction right. in the right way? They know much more about instruction than I do. <laughs> but just, it's, you really... It's fascinating what you can just learn about their experience. Mm-hmm. You can't really do that until you immerse yourself or just uh, listen to kids talk. Another way that I am just um, energized is that I have, I get to do it today, actually. Mm-hmm. I have a group of student advisors. Cool. And they are called the Superintendent's Advisory Board. And I know that they may think that, oh, that's just sort of something that she does Mm. to, you know, take, takes good pictures. It's a good photo op. And then other times I think I scare the kids because I tell them, and I'm really not kidding. (laughs) This is the most exciting thing that I look forward to Mm. every six weeks. This is what I most look forward to. And some of them look at me puzzled, (laughs) like you need a bigger life, (laughs) but I'm not kidding because kids are great kids are great they get a bad rap but um kids are brilliant and innovative and creative and kind yeah it's really good one other thing i like about lincoln in that book is that was really clear and i'm sure it is other places too is how he surrounded him with people that were not just good leaders but leaders that disagreed with him Absolutely. you know I mean, it's like his entire cabinet were filled with people who given the option, would have never elected him president ever. Yes. Um, and that's pretty profound and uh, challenging to leaders who just want to surround themselves with yes people. And, you know, so that's a really great book. I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought that up. Um, a few more questions for you. What, what have been uh, or are some of the biggest influences in your leadership journey? I mean, you mentioned you love to read books, but are there, are there people or those that you've been around uh, that, that really jump out to you as influencing your journey? Well, I think I, I've already mentioned my parents, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, they, the older I get, uh, the more wisdom that I can see, um, in their, in the way they live their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, both of my parents have gone on to be with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think the older you get, the, the more you, you reach back into your past and, um, it helps shape who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, clearly, um, the, so the previous superintendent at Friendship, so let's don't tell him that because yeah. he kind of has a big head sometimes. <laughs> I'm going to ask him to listen to this. So David Vrunland, you know, let's not take this too far. Um, but he really is a, he's a visionary leader. Mm-hmm. And I don't see myself as a visionary leader. Honestly, I didn't see myself as a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrongly assumed years ago that you were just kind of born with these leadership traits. Mm-hmm. And I do think some people are. Sure. I don't think I was. So I study leadership as a skill, just like you would study math or you would practice basketball mm-hmm. or your, you know, your backhand mm-hmm. as a tennis player. 
But um, so I really, I think it's that fear of failure that drives me and that, you know, I'm not really even sure I belong in this seat. Um, rather than holding me back, I think that pushes me. I'm very driven. Um, you know, of course, uh, stories in the Bible. Thank goodness for Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sure. he had a murderous past and God was still able to use him. So I'm sure. like, okay, there's a chance for me. Um, but, um, you know, and then I have these two sisters who have, one is a teacher, one is a nurse. They knew from an early age that's what they wanted to do with their lives, where I didn't. And they, and that's what they do. They are nurses and they are teachers and they're not ever going to have their name on a building sure. or anything like that. But I see in them just that heart for service mm -hmm. and um, it pushes me uh, to be a better leader. That's cool. Actually good. Last question for you. I always like this one. If you could speak to your younger self, you know, back 20, 25 years ago, what, knowing what you know now, what would you tell, you know, yourself 20 years ago? What lessons would you try to impart? So as a person who had really a winding journey of just not knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up, and that was a great source of stress for me, mm. of not knowing. Even into my adult years, it's like, okay, well, this is okay, but do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? If I could look back and tell myself something, I would say, Michelle, stop worrying so much about what your career is going to be and pay attention to what kind of person you're becoming. Mm -hmm. Am I a person of integrity? Am I honest? Am I kind? Mm -hmm. And so I would tell young people, I, you know, I was the worst offender as a high school counselor. What are you going to be? I wanted them to have plans, you know, right. of what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. um, but if I could just back up, we put so much pressure on kids, whether we mean to or not. It's really an innocent question. What are you going to do after you graduate? And just saying, you know, hey, as long as you get your foundational education, what kind of person are you becoming? And you know what? Um, the rest is going to fall into place. Um, God's going to honor mm -hmm. what you're trying to do and the trying of person, the kind of person you're trying to become. And so just relax a little. It's so fascinating you say that. I have a 10 and 8 year old and uh, they have no pressure from us. I mean, like we're trying really hard just to, you know, make sure they know without a shadow of a doubt they're, they're loved beyond. I mean, I can't already talk about it. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. That they're loved and that we'd go to, you know, every length possible to help them succeed. And even... Even in the midst of that, they they're constantly thinking about what they're going to be, you know. So it's fascinating, like even in a household where they're getting no pressure from us intentionally, um, they still gravitate towards, "Well, I'm going to be this." And so I've even found myself telling both of them, "No, no, don't, don't just don't worry about that right now. Great, if that's what happens, then awesome. But you got a long time to figure that out." Yes. And so I really appreciate you sharing that because it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really true. You know, I think another thing just, um, so I don't have any, my husband and I don't have any children of our own. We, we have 10,360 yeah. right now. <laughs> like a lot more than a few. <laughs> but you know, I would say also going back to the way that, that I was raised in just this environment of, um, no pressure from my parents, do mm -hmm. this, do that. It was my own head, mm -hmm. the voices in my head. And so I will, tell you that my parents and my sisters and really all the people that I can remember in my little town growing up all they did was encourage me to um, you know you can be whoever you want to be you can be whatever you want to be but Kate I'll tell you that it, it was um, it was the voices in my head mm -hmm. who said I don't think you're enough yeah I don't know if you're gonna be able to do fill in the blank um, so I'm just not sure you have it in you. Mm -hmm. And so isn't that fascinating how even though children who are surrounded with love and affection and encouragement that you still have these voices in yeah. your head that and tell you, you you're not enough. And these narratives and these stories mm -hmm. about yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. 
I really appreciate your time. This is really good. Uh, you know, for those listening to the podcast, we spent about 20 minutes solving all the world's problems before we started the real podcast. So too bad you didn't get a listen Check. in to that. <laughs> so, world's problems? Yeah. Check. Just watch the news this morning and Michelle, and I, or to, uh, you know, this morning or this evening, and you'll hear all of Michelle's and I's break, groundbreaking ideas. But really appreciate you. I just like watching from a distance, doing a phenomenal job at Friendship and you know, Lubbock and Friendship are really, really lucky to have you and, and you're doing really great work. So thanks for all your time. Oh my gosh, it was truly my pleasure.